Hi friends, thank you for joining us again for the ASP Stories weekend bonus episode. Join us on Mondays and Thursdays where we interview amazing guests where they share with us about their adventure sports and the amazing feats that they have done. But ASP Stories is where we get to listen in as authors read their adventure stories to us. So sit back with your hot cup of tea or coffee and kick off your adventure-filled weekend by listening in while we hear more from ASP Stories. The next four ASP Stories episodes will be with Sam Manicom. Sam has spent many years traveling around the world on his motorcycle, and he's written a few books to tell all about it. In these next four episodes, he'll be reading from his books Into Africa, Under Asian Skies, Distant Suns, and Tortillas to Totems. If you'd like to find out more about Sam and get his books, you can visit him at sam-manicom.com. You can also hear his interview on the Adventure Sports Podcast on episode 149. And now, here's Sam Manicom. Chapter 9. Red Tape and Farce. Henry David Thoreau said, Go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you have imagined. By the time I arrived in Madras, now called Chennai, it was hot and humid, and in spite of having slept really well, I felt tired and very sticky. But that didn't matter. Finally I was in Madras, and with luck my bike's container had been swung off the ship that very day. The rickshaw rank outside the station was a yellow and black swarm of three-wheeled bees. I soon had three drivers trying to persuade me that they knew the way, that their rickshaw was the fastest, and they were the safest driver. At that stage, I hadn't even told them where I wanted to go. It was the Broadland Guest House. Back in Calcutta, Billy had said that this was the perfect spot for me. Clean and well run, cheap, and better still, it had three courtyards. He'd been certain that I'd be able to get the bike in off the street. As a bonus, there were good, cheap restaurants nearby, and it was a short rickshaw ride away from the port. I later learned that the Broadland is run and staffed by retired railway workers, which explained why it was to such a high standard. The only downside to the place was that the staff were said to be racist towards other Indians, and I worried that this might mean I'd have to move on. Traffic is less frenetic in Madras, and my driver rickshawed me to the Broadland in a few minutes. On spelling my name, the reception clerk looked up at me over his glasses. Mister, you are not Indian. I explained that I was not and handed over my passport. I wasn't quite sure what was happening, but wondered if this was somehow something to do with the racism I'd heard of. Not the case at all. I discovered that I have a Tamil name. Manicum in the Tamil language means the eight precious stones. It was quite an odd feeling to find that people of a completely different race shared the name. I wondered if there was any sort of historical connection and made a mental note to someday try and find out. Over the coming weeks, I grew ever more grateful to Billy for putting me onto the Broadlands. It became a quiet haven at the end of each day of chaos and frustration at the port. I was still intending to extract the bike myself. Day one saw me down at the port, trying to get someone, anyone, to explain to me where I had to go and what I had to do to start the process. By chance, I could see my container from the road. I could clearly see the registration marks and knew that unless something dramatic had gone wrong, I was little more than a 100 metres from my bike. By day three I'd given up. I'd walked miles begged and pleaded, demanded and insisted, and had been treated with a complete lack of interest. I was going to have to find myself a shipping agent and see if we could come to some sort of deal. I hoped I'd find one who would, for a fee, guide me through the red tape and confusion, whilst leaving me to do the running. For three more days I knocked on doors and waited in sweaty corridors. No one was interested in helping me at all. Most of the agents, when I eventually made it through the layers of junior staff, said that they had no idea about getting foreigners' bikes out of the port and that anyway, they were too busy. Back at the Broadlands and too exhausted to go out to get food, I asked one of the staff to go for me. I'd noted on previous days that this could be done for a small fee, but had never taken advantage of the opportunity because every day on the streets was a chance to explore.
Within minutes, I was sitting at one of the wooden tables in the courtyard with a very good tali in front of me. A tali is a collection of curries and sauces served with rice. It's usually vegetarian, and in Madras, if you ate in a local restaurant, it would be served on a fresh banana leaf instead of a plate. The curries aren't hot, but are full of flavour. The sweetness of chai washes the tali down very well, and by the time I'd eaten, I was feeling much more human. At that moment, a stocky, moustached, blonde man of about 28 or 29 marched into the courtyard. He was swearing furiously in German. He strode up and down the courtyard, tense with rage and frustration at something. As he swore and raved, he slipped between German and English, and I began to get the picture. He too was a biker, and he had been in Madras trying to get his bike out of the port for a week longer than I had. Things were going as wrong for him as they were for me, and he had had enough of India. I introduced myself. Carsten was just about ready to kill people he was so frustrated, but he gradually began to calm down, in part, I think, because he realised that I was in the same boat. Red tape in India was introduced in the days of Raj and the East India Company, and I suspected that it was almost as frustrating for Indians to deal with as it was for a foreigner. The situation made me think about a sign I'd seen on the wall in the Madras post office. It was called Four People. It went like this. This is the story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody and nobody. There was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about it because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it. Nobody realised that everybody would not do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody and nobody actually accused anybody. Carsten told me that he'd found a shipping agent who had accepted the task of getting his bike out of the port. Nice people, he said, but they do nothing. When he mentioned the name of the company, I knew that I'd heard of them before at some time, but I'd duly forgotten the name. Winnie's shipping had a good reputation on the biker circuit. At that moment, as I cursed myself for not writing their name down when I'd heard it, I knew that things had taken a positive step forward. Carsten and I sat under the purple and pink bougainvillea in the courtyard, talking things through until the early hours of the next day. As the night cooled, so did he, a little. We decided that I would go with him to Winnie's on the Monday, this being a Friday night, and I would try to get them to take my work on too. The weekend was a time to relax and prepare. We talked bikes and travel. We drank endless cups of chai and I walked to the beach. Fishermen worked there, pushing their wooden boats out through the murky surf. Sari-clad women strolled amongst the line of man-made refuse that the sea had rejected. And seashell sellers pestered anyone they could find, blowing their conch shells as they strolled the beach, making quite an eerie sound float across the sands. One came and sat quietly by me, offering me a biddy cigarette. I shared my fruit with him, and the two of us sat watching the waves roll onto the sand. Further down the beach, a herd of water buffalo had been brought down to the water for a bath, and fishermen sat mending nets that had been hung up to dry on low wooden frames. Church bells tolled in the background, it was Sunday, and the buzz of the city seemed just a little quieter than on a weekday. I'd read that a good percentage of people in this area were Christians, and the sound of the bells in this very different part of the world was rather reassuring. The mini-holiday of the weekend came to a close too quickly in one way, but in another I was raring to go. Even Carsten seemed slightly less negative. I just hoped that something positive would happen for him. I didn't much want to be a witness to murder. The day started well when it clicked that we would be able to share the cost for rickshaw each day. We were both sure that there were going to be quite a few more trips to the port. Carsten took me into the shipping office, past guards, who looked the other way when we strode in, up a flight of dimly lit stairs that were lined by waiting men, into a small waiting room, which Carsten ignored, and straight on into a large open plan office. Sixteen desks were lined up, neatly set at ninety degree angles to one large desk in the room. This desk, whose top was held up on either side by sets of drawers, 
was flanked by two four-drawer grey-green filing cabinets, upon which were stacks of wire in trays. The surface of the desk was covered in papers and half-drunk polystyrene cups of tea and coffee. Behind the desk sat a well-dressed, beardless man whose hair was slicked back neatly with some sort of oil. He wore an expression on his face that was a combination of tired, kind and resigned. He greeted Carsten with a polite handshake and a face that said, Bad news, but I don't know how to give it. He greeted me with interest while one of his staff pulled across an extra chair for me. Once we were settled, Mr Johns got it over and done with. Mr Carsten, your motorcycle will not be free today. I am hoping that this may be possible by the end of the week. Thankfully, Carsten didn't blow up. Mr Johns was unable to offer an explanation other than, This is India, my friend. We are working hard for you. That gave me the opportunity to explain the reason for me being there. After an hour of discussion, three cups of chai and a further half hour of document reviewing, Mr Johns agreed to take the work on. Though he told me, you will need to be patient, you know, and glanced across at Carsten. He sent one of his staff down to the street to get photocopies of my paper and then sent us on our way. We were at Mr John's office every day for the next two weeks. We tried enthusing and buying chai. We tried gentle pushing too, but nothing seemed to work. We sat hour after hour in the waiting room next to Mr John's office and became as much a part of the office as the dead flies hanging from cobwebs in front of the dust-stained windows. Regular clients began to greet us. The guards started to welcome us, as if we were part of the family, but still nothing happened. All Mr Johns could say was, It's all moving forward, we are getting there. Carsten flickered between rage and an almost comatose acceptance. But even in the latter stage, I knew that there was a volcano bubbling below the surface, so I kept a close watch on him. Then, all of a sudden, I'd had enough. I needed a break. So I got a job. Actually, though, the job found me. I was sitting chatting in the back courtyard with a Dutch girl called Nanda. She'd just come down from Tibet, where she'd managed to get over the border from Nepal and had spent nearly a month hitchhiking around the country. This was quite a rare feat, and to have done it as a woman on her own made it even more special. Nanda was a sparkly, friendly person who bubbled enthusiasm. Her positive way was infectious. We had heard words that a movie tout was looking for extras, and for the hell of it, we decided to go and see what was up. Others were muttering that the extras were for a blue movie. There'd been rumours floating around that the porn industry was thriving in Madras, which holds the second largest filming business in India, second only to Bombay. Neither of us was interested in that type of work, but it was worth listening just in case. The deal was an all-expenses-paid trip to the hill station of Uti. Up there, a crew was filming an African safari movie in the wildlife park. We were supposed to get dressed up as rich western tourists and to mooch around in the background of the hotel, or to be filmed belting around the bush in a Land Rover, supposedly taking pictures of the elephants and lions. We were told that genuine African footage of lions was going to be spliced into the movie at a later date. The elephants were going to be Indian elephants. Well, no one would notice the difference, would they? It all sounded delightfully bizarre, and when they said that not only would we get food and accommodation, but we'd get paid for the work too, it seemed too good a chance to miss. We signed up, stored our kit, and the next day set off with the agent. We were supposed to travel by train, but at short notice the agent hadn't managed to get tickets for the five of us. Two other travellers had also signed up. We piled aboard a bus and travelled white-knuckled for the better part of a day, until we could get on the train which then took us further up into the hills. The final leg of the journey through lush tea plantations was by narrow-gauge railway. The little train rocked and swayed its way through an area that didn't look as if it had changed much for 50 years. Small stations with names such as Covedale and Wellington could have been plucked straight out of Dorset and plonked amongst the tea plantations, the dark-skinned people, the eucalyptus trees and the dust. Uti sits at the junction between Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Karnataka and was once the summer headquarters for the government of Madras. The town still has an air of unhurried privilege with its flower gardens, single-storey stone cottages and leafy winding lanes. <laughs>
In amongst these are churches, parks and Maharaja's summer palaces. We were told that in season the place retains little of the peace we were seeing. Large numbers of well-to-do families head up there to escape the heat of the lowlands. They bring with them all the requirements of modern life, including ghetto blasters. It was hard to imagine the town thus transformed. The agent had booked us into the tourist lodge on the commercial road. It was basic and cold, and I found myself wishing that I had my bike jacket and my sleeping bag, both of which were packed away with the bike. Still, the lodge was a roof over our heads and the next day the sun was shining. The trouble came when the agent found out that the film crew had already found some travellers in Uti. The scenes we'd come up for had been shot the day before. It seemed that none of us were to become Bollywood stars after all. We all elected to stay in Uti for a couple more days, even if we weren't going to get paid. The agent agreed to honour our return tickets to get back to Madras, and the tourist lodge had space for us for a little longer. Nanda and I set off to explore the hills around the town. Paths spread out and meandered over the hillsides, connecting hamlets with fields and woods. We found kids playing in a fresh air that was a complete contrast to that of the city on the coast. Here, the children all wanted their photos taken as they played games in the wild flowers that coated the hillsides. Old women sat outside their brick houses, sewing, grinding flour and cleaning vegetables. A man with a bright yellow turban and a vivid pink shirt sat washing vibrantly orange carrots in a clear water stream. On the hillside, we were well away from the sounds of traffic, and I realised that this, other than the sound of an axe hitting wood somewhere in the distance, was the quietest moment I'd had in a very long time. It was almost sad to have to head back to Madras, and I wondered how Carsten had been coping. Nothing seemed to have moved while I was away, other than that Carsten had progressed from chai to beer. At Winnie's, we tried demanding action, and started to insist that we went wherever our papers went. This way, we had the chance to see that things actually were happening and that our papers weren't just stuck in a back office collecting chai cup stains. Mr Johns was not happy about this, but I knew that Carsten wasn't going to stay in check for much longer, unless he saw movement of some sort, in fact any sort. I also thought it was a good opportunity for seeing more places and people that were usually hidden from the normal backpacker. It was at this time that we discovered Mr Johns had a taste for rum, and that when he was half cut, he'd worked like a lunatic for a couple of hours. Miraculously, things would seem to happen. In many parts of India, booze is illegal, and those that wish to drink have to qualify for a permit. The laws in Tamil Nadu had recently changed, and underground drinking dens that Mr Johns had been used to visiting for his illicit rum were being licensed. But the atmosphere in them hadn't changed. With low lighting... They reminded me of stage sets for bars in the days of prohibition in the USA. Though legal, the drinkers still did not meet each other's eyes, and the air was furtive. There were no women drinkers, but the men who'd had a healthy helping of booze were full of camaraderie. But they didn't stretch quite as far as singing bawdy songs. Bottles of booze were always served in brown paper bags, as if the drinkers were even trying to deceive each other. Half a bottle was Mr John's daily allowance, and when we were doing the buying, he was happy to enjoy it. Afterwards, he actually seemed to enjoy his work back at the office as well, at least for the amount of time he was able to keep at it. After a couple of hours, his eyes would begin to droop, and before long his head would be down on his desktop. That was the moment for us to leave, as we knew that nothing else would happen that day. But we always left feeling a little cheered. Phone calls had been made, documents signed and rubber stamped, and runners had been sent out with our papers in hand and looks of urgency on their faces. Still, no real progress, though. The weeks frittered by, and two weeks of strikes by the customs officers and dock workers hadn't helped either. Ships either had to lie up and wait outside the port or were being diverted elsewhere, an expensive business for all that was complicated with real style by the strikers. The customs officers went on strike on day one and by the end of that day had negotiated a solution to their problem. The next day, the port workers went on strike, and again, by the end of the day, their strike was over. The next day, the customs officers went back on strike, and so it continued. This hopscotch of industrial action stretched on for day after day, leaving Carsten and me with ticking clocks and dwindling budgets. 
I was also due to meet Birgit up in Nepal, and if things didn't get sorted out fairly rapidly, that plan was dead. To make things worse, the plague was hitting vast swathes of India, and people were dropping like flies. The longer the wait went on, the more concerned we were that the plague would reach as far as Madras. If it did, we were going to be faced with either running for it without the bikes, or continuing with fingers crossed that we would stay well. Neither option sat comfortably. At that time, an eminent Ayurveda expert and physician to the president, Mr Vredvrat Sharma, suggested burning cow dung cakes to keep the plague away. This was a, a time-tested remedy, apparently, but it didn't inspire confidence. Meanwhile, my delay was worsened by circumstances straight out of a Laurel and Hardy script. The port's container stacking area was like a mini multicoloured city with blocks and avenues. No trees, just miles of asphalt and rusty yellow cranes that reminded me of giant stick insects. My container was stacked in a 500 metre long row of similar containers, all of them baking in the sun, and at the end of the row stood a broken crane. Normally, that would have been no more than a hassle for the dock workers. It wouldn't have held things up for me, however long it took for the crane's spare parts to arrive and for them to be fitted. This time, things went horribly wrong. The asphalt roadway at the other end of my row collapsed, and a three by four metre hole had appeared. There was no way a crane could safely span this hole, and that was that. Until the hole was investigated and repaired, the only way I was going to get my bike would be to cut a bike-sized hole in the side of the container with an acetylene torch when no one was looking. Hey guys, if you want to help support the Adventure Sports Podcast, do us a favor and visit our site at adventuresportspodcast.com and click on the sponsor links on the right-hand side of the page. Even if you're not in the market for one of their products right now, it's always good for them to know that you're hearing about them on our show. If you'd like to support us directly, you can visit our site at www180 tack there you'll find the 180 stove and 180 flame camp stoves, as well as the Bearline Plus utility system. Consider picking one up for yourself or maybe even for your fellow adventurer. And last but not least, you can always visit patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast and donate a little bit to the show. Thanks for being awesome listeners. We truly value you guys. And now back to the show. plague was spreading. Fortunately, it was still a long way away, but for us, it added another pressure. I hated to think what hell it was playing with people's lives on the other side of India. But then Diwali happened. I think that Mr Johns had mentally donned a tin helmet before he told us that. While Diwali was on, not much business would get done. It's one of the biggest and supposedly the happiest of all Hindu celebrations, but for us the bad news was that Nothing would go on for five whole days. I was fairly regularly in contact with Birgit now, and I could see that there was a very good chance that the cheap, non-refundable tickets she'd bought would be wasted. I knew that, as someone not long out of university, this would be a major financial loss for her, and besides that, we were really looking forward to seeing each other. Goodness knew when the chance would happen again, if this all went pear-shaped. I tried not to sulk, and knew that I was lucky to be in the country at a time of such a major celebration, but I just wanted my bike. Even I was becoming a little belligerent now. Mr John's advice was, when everybody else is on holiday, you must have a holiday too. Nothing is going to happen this week. Go away, be tourists. Forget your troubles for a week. Go on, you're free. Carsten took that bit of advice like a mouthful of the most foul-tasting medicine you can imagine, and that fact was spread all over his face. I had to physically drag him out of the office and back to the Broadland, but that night I decided to take Mr John's advice. I wasn't going to spend any more time sitting around in Madras waiting for something to happen. I was going to take control of life again and do something, anything. I asked Carsten where he really wanted to go in India. I said... Pretend that you will never get your bike back and you're going to have to fly home in a week. Where would you like to go? To my surprise, instead of saying straight to the airport anyway, he said that he'd like to go to Puri. It's a fairly small seaside town way up on the coast towards Calcutta. Puri is a major Hindu religious centre and the beach was supposed to be great, 
Carsten also told me that there were shops where you could buy grass over the counter, and that he wanted to be able to do that at least once whilst he was in India. He liked to smoke. My guidebook said that the place was interesting, and I thought, if Diwali is on, and it's a major religious centre, then perhaps there will be interesting things going on that are connected to the celebrations. It all depended on whether, at this late stage, we could get train tickets. We went to the train station on spec, and a short time later found ourselves on the up train, with just one change to make at a junction just south of the city of Bhubaneswar. It was a long ride, and the train was packed. There wasn't even a remote chance to slot our bunk beds into position, but that was fine. The crush of seated people held us up for much of the journey. In the earlier days of train travel in India, platform food and the drinks were served in biodegradable containers. A potter would sit at the end of the platform and using a foot-operated potter's wheel, he'd turn out cup after cup, leaving them in the sun to bake hard. The chai sellers would slot 20 or so of these cups into each other and you could always see where the sellers were by these terracotta towers. The beauty was that when you'd finished your tea, you'd just binned your cup out of the window and the next rains would wash it back into the earth. Now the cups are polystyrene. The same sort of thing had happened with bowls. These were once made of large leaves which had been stitched together and dried in bowl-shaped moulds. They would stay stiff long enough for you to eat your rice and whatever it was, and then you would flick the empty bowl out of the window to rot down, or be munched by a holy cow. Holy cows are India's natural garbage collectors, and they survive, particularly in the cities, on what humans throw away. But the bowls are now made out of tin foil. The problem is that people follow the custom of generations, and everything still gets binned out of the windows. As a result, the railway tracks and surrounding countryside are a mess of refuse. I caught Carsten just too late to stop him throwing his cup out of the window. Challenged, he rather indignantly said, The locals all do it. I persuaded him that we should use one of our carrier bags to collect our rubbish in. Rather than go to the effort of arguing, he agreed. For the next seven hours, in front of an audience of bemused fellow travellers, we carefully collected our rubbish. At major stations, small boys leap onto the trains with hand brushes made out of palm leaves. Most of the boys, I'd been told, were orphans living on the streets. For a small amount of money, which they would collect from the passengers in each compartment, they would sweep out all the rubbish. The system works really well. They earn a living, and the collections of orange peel, peanut shells, sweet wrappers and so on are regularly cleared away. Thinking that I was helping, and had found a way to get rid of our carrier bag of rubbish without losing my seat, I gave the nearest boy the bag and a rupee. He looked in the bag looked at me, looked back in the bag, shook his head as if confused, walked over to the window and threw the bag out. Carsten laughed harder than I'd seen him do since I'd met him. We eventually arrived in Puri, and as we agreed, we telephoned Mr Johns just in case. Ah, Mr Sam, Mr John said. Great news, come into the office tomorrow, you can have your motorcycles. We were stunned. It had been a very long, backside-numbing journey we had to decide what to do. Stay for a couple of days now we'd come this far, or scoot back to Madras as quickly as possible before whatever had suddenly gone right went wrong again. Would we get train tickets anyway? We stayed the night, Carsten bought his grass and proceeded to fumigate the room, and then we crashed. In the morning he said, I'm going back, today, even if I have to fight for a ticket or ride on the roof but there were no seats to be had for the next three days, and even third class was fully booked. The ticket man must have noticed our disappointment and took pity on us. He sold us second-class standing tickets. We'd never heard of these before, but grabbed them gratefully. We were on the next train, the fullest I'd ever been on. It was more crushing than standing. With a delay between trains in Bhubaneswar, we had just enough time to get to one of India's most famous zoos. It's one of the places where you can see white tigers, and though I don't like zoos much, it was too good an opportunity to miss. The zoo, though, was pretty grim. It looked unkempt, and so did the tigers, magnificent though they still were. But the saddest thing about the visit came from learning that one of the tigers had incarcerated himself. He'd been a wild tiger, but had leapt into the zoo's tiger compound in search of a mate. He'd found one, 
but then couldn't get back out. When the Madras down train arrived at the station, it was even more crowded than the Puri train had been. The only relatively free space to stand or squat was immediately outside one of the toilets, which already stank. The regular roll of the train would flap the toilet door open, allowing the hole in the floor to gust stench over us. It was hard not to be sick. To add spice to the journey, the train suddenly stopped in the middle of nowhere. The wheels from the carriages in front of us had suddenly started making a weird noise and the train's crew had piled on the brakes. The train sat for an hour, with no information being passed as to what the problem was. The packed-in people started to get very restless and many piled off the train and down onto the tracks. After another half an hour, we did too. At least it was a chance to get a stretch and some fresh air. The air around the toilets was now ever more fetid as the heat in the standing carriage grew. A crowd of men, excitedly offering advice, clustered around the underside of a carriage further up the train. Somehow, the joint in the rails that the train was now straddling had opened up a gap of more than 30 centimetres. That accounted for the strange noise, but what were the crew going to do now? We'd been incredibly lucky not to derail. With the overcrowded state of the train, it would have been a major disaster. The solution, a further hour later when it was obvious that no help was coming, was to start the engine and drive on, very slowly. Our carriage shook violently as each of the big metal wheels clunked into the gap. Madras is a golden city after a journey like that, and Broadlands was like a palace. We showered, discussed burning our clothes, and then fell into our beds. My alarm went off three hours later to tell us that Winnie's would be open in 45 minutes. We had time for a chai, and then for the rickshaw dash to the office. Carsten was wide awake and bouncing from one foot to the other as he gulped his chai and implored me to drink the scalding liquid faster. At the shipping office, Mr Johns, grave-faced, invited us to sit in front of his desk. I have bad news for you, he said. We made a mistake. We do not yet know when you can have your motorcycles. Carsten flipped. He'd sat with his legs under Mr John's desk and with one almighty heave and a furious bellow, he kicked the underside of the desk so hard that the whole thing lifted off the ground. Half-drunk chais and coffees spilt all over the official-looking papers, and behind us, all typewriting stopped. Every set of eyes turned towards us as Carsten stood, now speechless with rage. Mr Johns looked at me and said, Mr Carsten is upset. He mustn't be upset. What is the problem? I explained in my best British voice of reserve, you are right, Mr Johns. He is now very upset. Perhaps it really is time to make something happen to get him his motorcycle. It is like being without his wife for him, you know. At that moment, Mr Johns' boss came out of his office and beckoned the agent across. The two of them conferred, with eyes flicking from each other to cast in as they talked. By the time Mr Johns had returned to us and the typewriters were clacking importantly again, the plan that we should become temporary shipping agents had been hatched. With them, we could try to get in to see the port manager. This was the only way that we could get the whole thing jump-started. At that moment, we would have tried just about anything, and the level of risk to all involved was never even discussed. Mr Johns was confident, and we assumed that he had the backing of his boss. We never dreamt that the plan would result in Mr Johns and I being arrested. If we'd been aware that Carsten was going to have to resort to hitting port policemen to escape, then we would never have gone along with the idea, but by then we'd been battling with Indian red tape and procedure for nearly six weeks. My original idea that, as I'd already experienced clearing my bike from ports a couple of times, I could save money and do it myself in Madras too, without paying for an agent, was a case of ignorance's bliss. I'd been in India before on a couple of trips with a backpack, so I thought I knew enough to be realistic. I knew that it would take at least two weeks, maybe three, to find my way around and to work my way through the usual red tape. In retrospect, the daftness of this thought was quite sublime. Madras port reeked with the smells of diesel, sun-baked concrete, unwashed bodies and the collected grime of a century or more. All of this was spiced by the tang of sea and the rich curry scents from the food stalls just outside the gates. 
The humidity floated this heavy load through the air with an effort that just added to the lazy torpor of the midday heat in southern India. But I wasn't bothered. We'd done it. We'd actually blagged our way in to see the manager of the port. At last things seemed to be on the move. Perhaps finally we'd get our bikes. The manager's desk was covered in glass paperweights. These seemed to act as a visible sign of rank. The more a person had, the higher up the scale he was. They also stopped the paper chaos that covered his desk from being wafted out of his window onto the water of the harbour below. Not that they would have been noticed down there. The rolling waters were covered in a collection of a working harbour's waste. Polystyrene cups bobbed alongside oil-stained wood, bits of old rope, torn cardboard, food packaging and a dead cat. The chunk of seaweed that had joined them probably regretted losing its footing on the harbour bed. All of these slopped lazily in a rainbow of spilt oil. His office was not what I'd expected for a man of such high position. The decor was worn-out minimalist. The paint on the walls a pale green gloss and peeling up towards the ceiling. The floor was grey-painted concrete and his desk was a basic metal affair but with a very large top. The manager had been surprised to see us but recovered quickly. It couldn't be often that his day would be invaded by two European motorcyclists pretending to work for a shipping agent and the agent himself. Mr Johns had almost grovelled in his respect for this powerful man. It was only at that moment that I realised just how far he'd stuck his neck out to get us into the port and into this office. The manager sat back in his creaky chair and looked at the three of us with an air of concern. Surely this had to be a good sign. With not a moment to lose, I stepped forward to tell our tale, before Carsten could. Carsten had had enough of India, of delays, the heat and the constant hassle. He'd ceased to be even remotely tactful, and I knew that if I wasn't quick enough, all the effort to get us in would have been a sweaty waste of time. The manager listened carefully. Then, with a sudden burst of action, which surprised even Mr Johns, he pulled across a thin sheet of paper from one of the piles. With his fountain pen, he scribbled a paragraph of words. He then grabbed a couple of rubber stamps. With heavy-handed enthusiasm, he thumped an ink pad with them, and then his sheet of paper. He looked up, smiled, apologised for the delay, and then turned away from us as if we'd already vanished from the room. Outside the office, Mr Johns read the sheet, and with almost boyish excitement he said, This is it. Very wonderful. You will have your motorcycles by the end of the week. Carsten's expression was extremely cynical. After all, we'd heard this before. During the six weeks we'd been trying to get our bikes released from the port, this had almost been a catchphrase. I tried to be a little more positive. The sheet had been signed by the port manager himself, and it did have those still damp rubber stamps all over it. We headed back out into the glaring sunshine and started the long walk over the dusty railway tracks, through the loading yards, past the labourers resting in the shade of a warehouse and across the baking heat of the main entrance area. The port is guarded by two fences. The outer fence had a guard post manned by a pristine khaki-clad men who toted rifles and behaved with arrogant officiousness. Their job was to check that those entering the port had the right to do so. We'd been checked on the way in, and there'd been a fingers-crossed moment. Our papers were rather dodgy documents stating that we were temporary shipping agents, and that we had an appointment with the port manager. The reality was that we were nothing of the sort, and didn't have a firm appointment. Mr Johns, though, had managed to get us permission to get as far as the boss's secretary. The papers worked well enough, and we'd been impatiently waved through. Now on the way out we had to deal with the guards on the inner gate. Their job was to make sure that no one was taking anything out of the port that they shouldn't have been, and, I suppose, making sure that no one was slipping illegally into India. One of the guards squinted towards Mr Johns and me as we approached the gate. As he did so, he lowered his rifle so that it pointed at us. This did not look good. Carsten was 15 metres behind us as we moved closer to the guard. The guard spoke imperiously and aggressively at Mr Johns, who put a slightly shaky hand on my arm to hold me where I was. A rapid and very furious argument followed. 
With much arm-waving, my permit and passport were studied as a crowd collected around us. Suddenly I felt like a Martian, and I didn't need to speak Tamil to know that somehow we'd been rumbled. The fact that I was suddenly being poked in the ribs with a rifle made it all the more obvious that we were in trouble. At that moment, Karsten came running straight past us, almost thumping his way through the crowd. The inner gate guards were too stunned to do anything for a moment, but were soon shouting words to the effect of Stop that man! to the outer guards. But they were too late, as with a final shove of the man who had the misfortune to get in the way, Karsten was out of the gate and running through the crowded street. Much later he told me that he'd forgotten to take any ID documents with him. He'd realised that the treatment we were getting would probably intensify tenfold when he was stopped. Our guards were incensed. Mr Johns and I were pushed and shoved across the entrance yard, past the first warehouses and into a small office in which not a jot of air moved. The fan wasn't working and the men sat quietly on wooden benches with sweat pouring down their faces. The man sitting behind an enormous wooden desk, totally out of proportion to the size of his office, had large sweat marks under his arms and across the chest of his uniform too. He was one of the largest men I'd seen in southern India so far and he must have been suffering miserably. We were like a mini explosion into this sleepy, uncomfortable little office. Moments later, after much shouting, with red betel nut spit flying enthusiastically from the lips of our guard, Mr Johns and I were thrust roughly into a small room. The door was locked, leaving us to look at each other with slight disbelief. We sat listening to the continued shouting from the outside office. Moments later, a guard burst in, grabbed Mr Johns by the arm and pulled him out of the room. That was the last I saw of him for four days. It took that long for the shipping company to bribe him free. It turned out that Mr Johns was in deep trouble and I felt incredibly uncomfortable about it. For us it had been a bit of an adventure and potentially the end of a very long and frustrating wait to get the bikes out of the harbour. I was released by the port police within a few hours, but it was several days before Mr Johns was able to start work for us again. Now he worked quietly. He'd had a big fright, and I think he simply wanted to get rid of us. I felt sad. Over the weeks, we'd got to know a lot about this kind, friendly man and his family, and now I felt that it was we who had let him down. It wasn't his fault that he was stuck working in a system that seemed about as functional as a pen with no ink. It was definitely time to move on. Carsten got his hands on his bike just two days later. He transformed from being one very angry biker into a man with few cares. But the experience led him to a hatred of all things Indian. It was another four days before I was told that my container had been pulled out of the row and was about to be unloaded. This time I was back in the port with the right papers and thankfully my guard didn't seem to be on duty. The container stood on its own on the back of a trailer in the yard and I looked for a forklift of some sort. I'd no idea where the bike had been stashed in the container but knew that the dockyard workers who'd come to unload the container wouldn't be expecting a bike to be so heavy. Mr Johns had told them what I was there for. The workers were scrawny, doty clad men who seemed as interested in what they were about to do as they were at the thought of lifting themselves from their shady spots. A headman of some sort tried to drum up some enthusiasm and failed miserably. But the men did get up and a customs officer broke the seal on the container. The rusty door creaked open and there was my craze right at the front, but had been packed on the top. That made it roughly two and a half metres off the ground. I couldn't see how they were going to wrestle it out without a forklift. I didn't speak the language and had no way of stopping what happened next. With surprising speed, a large empty crate was pulled in front of the trailer. Four men stood on top, and with equally surprising strength, they pulled my crate out towards them. The crate fell out of the container, scattering the workers, and hit the ground with a horrible crunch. It shattered the crates the workers had been standing on, and the force of the impact smashed my crate open. It had landed at a 45 degree angle on one corner, and at that moment I was sure I had a dead motorcycle on my hands. I was angry with the workers, but at the same time very happy that none of them had been caught under the crate. If they had been, they would have been in a real mess. I stood, quite stunned, 
for what seemed like a very long time. This was big time trouble. The crew helped me break the rest of the crate open. As we did so, I was really thankful that the fan maker's mate in Penang knew his business. The bike had been incredibly well supported inside, but with the front wheel off to cut bulk, most of the impact seemed to have been taken by the bike's forks. This was either good news, as the springs would have absorbed a lot of the impact, or grim news if the forks were bent, and they looked bent. The bike had twisted free of its straps and bracing points, and a good amount of weight had landed on the front brake disc. We'd strapped the front wheel next to the forks. The mudguard was cracked, an indicator had snapped off, and so had a mirror, but the forks had only twisted in the head brace, or so it seemed. The men helped me to lift the wheel back between the forks. Once bolted into place, I loosened off the head brace. This allowed me to use the wheel to lever the forks a little more into position. So far so good, but when I turned the wheel, it looked as if the disc had been bent. This would make for interesting braking, though perhaps not bad enough to have a new disc sent out from home. The men watched shamefacefully as I put the rest of the bike together, collected up the broken parts, and loaded the luggage onto the racks. Now she looked like a bike, but I was worried. She'd had a very long fall, and I'd no idea what other damage there was. I tried to put things into perspective by thinking about the number of times I'd fallen off the bike in Africa, and that she had survived those. Surely this impact had been no worse. I didn't feel able to tip the workers, though I knew that in reality what had happened wasn't their fault. It was just life. I rode out of the harbour gates and within seconds realised that I really was free. I'd done it. I had my bike back. I was behind schedule, but that didn't matter. A plan could be made. What did matter was that I had my freedom back. India stretched before me, and if I got a scoot on, I could still make it to Kathmandu in time to meet up with Birgit. With all these thoughts in mind, I hardly noticed that I was riding in Indian traffic. All right, that'll wrap it up for Sam's reading of Under Asian Skies. Be sure to tune in next week for an excerpt from his book, Distant Suns. Until then, get out and have some fun. <laughs>